So now for conclusions on the clustering chapter in text mining. We had this very condensed, there are many clustering methods that we did not look at because they just don't seem appropriate for textual data. But a lot of this was covered in the other class, or it will still be covered in the other class. So clustering text data has, um, is, is hard, just as working with text data in general tends to be surprisingly difficult because we have like this discrete input and not a continuous valued input, then we make these arbitrary decisions on how to preprocess the data. TFIDF is not a proven thing. It's a heuristic that someone came up with a long time ago and no one has like found a better way to do this. Well, by now we have these the bird vectors, for example, that often are better, but for sentences and words, not for entire documents. So we still don't really have, in my opinion, something that beats TFIDF completely. Nor do we have anything that is more proven from a theoretical point of view, where we could show that it has better capabilities. So that is kind of, kind of disappointing. And it works OK, but doesn't really work great. So um, yeah. And we really never know whether the decisions that we make are optimal. And if we run k-means several times, we may get clusterings that are very different, which kind of tells us that none of them is optimal. But instead, there may be just parts that are sometimes captured better, sometimes worse, clusters that could be split or could be kept in one cluster, for example. So um, the, all these are challenges of text data. Text data is high dimensional, but it is also sparse. We are, tend to work with ang these angles instead of Euclidean distances. And it means that a lot of the motivation that we have in clustering actually breaks when we move to this type of data. We have methods that assume there's a Gaussian distribution, while we don't in text data. There are methods that assume we have large distances between objects in different uh, clusters, small distances to objects in the same cluster. But this is high dimensional data. The distances tend to become more and more similar. And we have large errors on that. We have very noisy data. We have kind of imprecise measurements. Because if you have a short text, and it gets worse, much worse, if you have shorter text. So in the tutorial, we are working with the Simpsons articles. And the long articles, they work very well. The short articles work much worse. Now, if you would move on to tweets, that would probably be an issue. Some tweets, you only have three, four words. And you can't get a lot of information out of that. That's kind of due to the input. We have this discrete words, words that can occur or not. We can't have a 10% occurrence of a word that maybe is in the tweet. So um, that tends to break our notion of distance and how reliable a distance measurement is. We always assume, well, we have the, the ruler, and we can put the ruler in here, and we measure the distance, and then it's correct, plus minus a millimeter or whatever. But that doesn't work on, on this type of data. Hmm? Does it become better if we don't use the TF-IDF matrix directly, but the vector word embeddings instead? For example, if we represent every document as like the mean of the word embeddings? In my experience, it gets worse. Because if you take the mean of a lot of word embeddings, they all converge to pretty much the same value. So you have a, have a lot of high dimensional vectors that become more, more and more similar. And then you take average of these averages. Um, you, you get a similar issues, so that doesn't solve a lot. And um, there is one progress we will be coming on that in the, on the embeddings chapter that kind of tries to move into that direction, uh, which is sentence bird, which at least tries to focus on obtaining better embeddings on the sentence level. Whereas the typical embeddings you get from BERT that have this classification token, they do produce a token for the sentence. 
but it's kind of a starting value for this for the model. It's not really a summary or anything, and it all, they all have the tendency to to move, to converge to two similar values that are central. And then it works for the easy cases and the common cases, which scores well, but on all the difficult cases it breaks. And there are some assumptions that we tend to put in on this level of intuitions. Not just the intuition of distance tends to break down. But if you are begin a beginner in cluster analysis, there's always the idea, well, I partition my data, put objects into different partitions, and that's it. But it turns out if you would try this even on a small text data set, you would figure out, wait, it isn't easy for a human to sort these documents into distinct partitions. So if you try to sort your emails into folders such that the, document, the emails belong to exactly one folder, you will notice that it can be uh, ambiguous, And then you will have to find, search for folders in different places, for, for emails in different folders. And that's why some email providers now prefer the notion of labels instead of uh, folders, because then you can put things into multiple folders. We could have a folder with bills, and you could have a folder with your, for let's say, your leisure time or your family, and then you can put a, a bill into the, both of them. It's for family and it's a bill. So um, that kind of shows that it's not that obvious how to do these things. And you will probably have then still have some emails that end up in some other folder <laughs> because they don't fit into any of the major categories. So documents may be in multiple clusters or in none of them. But most of the algorithms that we use are not prepared for this. They assume everything belongs to exactly one cluster. So it doesn't fit. And some cases we can handle with particular algorithms, but um, it, they all have their open ends that are still unresolved. So there's the notion of bi-clustering that kind of closely related to subspace clustering, which you have seen in the MLCD lecture, where you cluster kind of both documents and terms at the same time. It's coming from genome analysis. So you have to have genes that are kind of your features, and you have your measurements of different experiments. But a lot of the genes may be irrelevant. So a cluster will always have some subset of genes that is relevant and some that are not. And that is also kind of um, an idea that you could try on text data, but you could argue some words are relevant for a cluster and some are not relevant. But there's not a one-on-one -on -one correspondence. So a word could be relevant for multiple clusters. A document could be in multiple clusters. A document could be in none of the clusters. And there could be some words that are not relevant for any cluster, stop words. So that would make a lot of sense, but the algorithms won't really scale to this type of data either. And they tend to assume, again, some continuous values don't work that well with very sparse data and all of this. We can do some um, parts of this with frequent items at ma mining. Maybe I will be putting a, a summary, summarized version at the end of the lecture, depending on fa how fast we are. Uh, finding frequent phrases, for example. But in the end, it's always, we have this heuristics, they produce some result. We don't have an objective measure that would tell us whether a result is good or bad. But we must treat it as like an idea generator. It's an explorative approach, and it, it's successful if we understand, as humans, understand the data better than we did before. It's not about optimizing some number for the computer, because the computer can't really use the result. It will never be that good to automate product development with this. And hence, there is this saying already from the 80s, from a well-known textbook, the validation of clustering structures is the most difficult and frustrating part of cluster analysis. 
Without a strong effort in this direction, cluster analysis will remain a black art accessible only to those true believers who have experience and great courage. Well, I don't think we have made that much progress in that direction of evaluation. So it works for Gaussians. <laughs> it doesn't work for more complex data. So because of these limitations of classic clustering approaches when applied to text data that kind of done, doesn't fit the assumptions of the methods, maybe we need a method that is actually developed for text that is primarily developed for text and then maybe can be somewhat adopted to other data types. But it should be something that understands the particularities of text, that words could be um, irrelevant, could be stop words in there, that um, a document could have multiple topics. And that is why people eventually came up with the idea of topic modeling, which is not that different from clustering, but it kind of approaches it with a different mindset. The mindset of finding shared recurring topics in the corpus instead of sorting objects into partitions. Putting the topics first and not the labels first. And I think that is why topic modeling um, kind of is more useful or more popular and more understandable when it comes for, to text than clustering. 